morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to, as a veteran who was here at the creation in 2008, congratulate Thierry de Montréal and his extraordinary team uh, to give us the chance to see each other again in person uh, in this terrible crisis that we've had. Uh, it's wonderful to see, see each other again in person. The preceding panel focused on economic trends, although they touched about some power questions looking at the relationship between China and the world. This panel will focus on power relationships in present international politics. There's a lot of noise and there's a, there are many tumultuous events. We want to look beyond them and uh, identify how, the, how various key actors and regions, US, Europe, Russia, China, how they are affected by the tectonic shifts in the geopolitical structure and uh, how they shape them. Um, and one of the typical examples of a lot of noise and tumultuous events is the withdrawal from Afghanistan. But what we have to ask ourselves is what is the geopolitical meaning uh, of the withdrawal? Who is to gain? Some argue the U.S. lost, others argue the U.S. gained from this withdrawal. Similarly, the AUKUS pact between Australia, the U.S. and the U.K. caused an enormous shock. Lots of consternation, disappointment, hurt feelings, breach of trust, all of that. But we have to look beyond it. Is there a new constellation of power, a new power balance emerging between China and a group of Western states led by the US? Where does France place itself? Where does the European Union place itself in this? What role does the US accord to Europe? Uh, what do we have to think about the notion of European autonomy in this context? What does it mean? Is it, is it real? Is it a genuine alternative? And uh, looking at the somewhat inept way the US pulled out of Afghanistan and organized the AUKUS pact, um, how is the US, the Biden administration, going to balance this, what the economist called ferocious complexity of reconciling on the one hand, confrontation and conflict with China, with on the other hand, the need for cooperation on global issues such as climate or health. And if we look at Russia, again, we have to go beyond the conflict, which is definitely the case. And at the moment, relations with, with the world, with the West are not are really at their, at their lowest point. We have to look beyond it and ask ourselves the geopolitical question of the future. And the Russians do that too. Uh, is it in the West's interest to have a Russia that remains a satellite of a powerful and rising China? Is it in Russia's interest? And as we sit here, the Trade Technology Council created between the European Union and the US to reset their economic relationship is actually meeting in Pennsylvania. Um, are the two blocks still the most important power block in the world in terms of economics? Are they going to reformulate and re, uh, redo the, lip, the orders and regulations of the liberal world order? and do this at a time when the Biden administration has not discarded many of the protectionist and America first ideologies of the Trump administration. So these are open questions. And to conclude my questions, uh, two, two general questions. Um, is the emerging conflict with China uh, going to structure and dominate 
the world in the same way as the old Cold War with the bipolar structure between the US and the Soviet Union once did. And in its combination of confrontation and interdependence and cooperation on the other hand, how does this conflict differ from the preceding Cold War conflict? And how does this affect the likelihood of war? which, after all, the Cold War avoided, thank God. So, with these questions, I turn to the panel, where we have wonderful expertise <coughs> gathered here. I'm not going to introduce them with all their background, because you can read that in the, in the uh, introduction. And I will start, and please, uh, since our time is limited, confine yourself to six to seven minutes. I will hold up my watch when the time comes. And uh, we will start right here on my left uh, with Jean-Claude Cruffaut, who is a banker by background and who now heads, the, who is now the chairman of the Competitive Enterprise Institute in Washington. Jean-Claude. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll start by apologizing for not wearing a tie. Uh, I'm the victim of a transit of luggage between two airlines. A good lesson, always take the same airline to make sure that your luggage follows. <laughs> Having said that, I will try to be brief and essentially cover three points. First of all, we have the constant, I would say, of the US policy since World War II. And uh, we have several periods and several themes. We're all driven by the United States. The first one was the Cold War. You just made a reference to that. That Cold War was specific in a sense that it was purely military. There was no other type of relationship between Russia and the Soviet bloc and the rest of the world. It was purely military. There was no investment. There was no trade. There were two different worlds. The Cold War we're talking about potentially between China and the rest of the world or part of the world is a very different nature. Then the Cold War was followed by the war on terror. The war on terror was a mixed bag and the result was in a, in a way, and you mentioned Afghanistan. Uh, personally, I think it was a mistake to be in Afghanistan for more than taking care of bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and tried regime change. We've seen that the basic failure of the, the war on terror was the attempt to change regime and impose a different type of institution, democratic institution, on societies and culture that were not ready for that. We can mention that's clearly the case in Afghanistan, that's clearly the case in Iraq, that's the case in Libya, and probably the case in Egypt as well. Then followed the Trump period, if you will. And the Trump period was essentially characterized by the fact, and I'm quoting someone else, Trump foreign policy was both moral and transactional. He had no ideology. Trump had never had any type of ideology. He had, if you will, sort of off-the-cuff reflex. He has fixation. He's a person who's narcissist and psychopath type of attitude. I can say some negative things for, on Trump because I'm also going to say some positive things about Trump. But the fact of the matter is that Trump, with America first, essentially didn't change fundamentally the relationship with the rest of the world, but the style changed dramatically. And there was this fascination for authoritarian regime. And that was also the fact that he wanted to abolish, go back on some of the engagement that had been taken by previous administration whether the Paris Accord on climate change or the so-called joint cooperative agreement on the g 2 pa which is the nuclear deal with Iran. So uh, we had this policy and then there was a change and then there is the renegotiation of NAFTA with the new Mexican-Canada trade agreement. So that's the first point. The second point is in spite of the change of administration, there is a continuity of policies in terms of foreign relations. And I can only I 
refer you to a paper just been published by Richard Hess that I'm sure many of you are familiar with from the Council of Foreign Relations in the last issue of Foreign Affairs, where it basically says there's not much difference between go back to Bush, 43, then Obama, then uh, Trump, then now Biden. Essentially, as you mentioned, there's been no real change in terms of the protectionist measures that were taken by the Trump administration, the tariffs that were imposed on China, but also on European products, uh, the limitation that we've seen in terms of international trade. Uh, these policies have not really been modified substantially. The only thing that you can say, there might be a difference of style, and I'm not even sure of that. And the second point is that we've seen effectively that Biden is trying, and you mentioned it for China, Biden is trying to rebuild the relationship, saying we may be in disagreement on other things, but at least we're in agreement on climate change. And then he sent Kerry to China recently, as you well know, and that was not a big success, to be perfectly honest. So there is some uncertainty about that. The, the other point that I want to mention is the building frustration that have ha occurred over the last decade and again over many presidencies. And we can talk about the percentage of contribution to the NATO budget. The, uh, the US administration started with Bill Gates, but continued with other administration, during other administration, wants to see at least a contribution of 2% of the members of NATO to the budget. And we are only on average at 0 0.170, 180. The only two countries that are spending more than 2% are the US and the UK. That explains a number of things. There was also some frustration on the other side. The European signed an agreement with China just at the time of the uh, change of administration in Washington in December 2020. And that was not very well received by the uh, administration. On the other hand, on the other hand, you have, as you mentioned, Afghanistan, where clearly the decision and the logistic of the pullback was purely an American decision without any consultation with allies or even the member of the coalition. And the result is what we've seen, which is a complete debacle. So when you put all of that into perspective, you, you shouldn't be surprised if things are not going well between the different parties to the transatlantic alliance. And the result of that can be seen in some of the things that <laughs> we've observed recently. The story of the submarines. I'm told that the story of the submarine is largely the fact that the Australian became very well aware of the assertive policy of China and were concerned that the solution brought by the French were not necessarily what was needed. They went to the Brits and the Brits went to the Americans and then happened what you, what you all know. I'll, I'll finish by just talking briefly about the uh, new Cold War. The new Cold War, in my sense, does not really exist as a Cold War because the other relations are too important. And they are particularly important, and I'll stop here, for China, because just two numbers to keep in mind. The import-export of goods and, and services represent 25% of the American GDP and 35% of the Chinese GDP. So the trade relation is much more important for China than for the US, particularly because the balance between import and import is much more in favor of China. China export. For the US, we export about 11%. The Chinese export half of the 35%. So they're much more dependent on that. So I'll stop here and I'll be happy to take questions later. Thank you very much. Elizabeth Gigou, whom we know, of course, as former chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Assemblée Nationale and member of the French government. Thank you, Carl. Uh, je vais parler français. Oui, oui, hein? ça va. Que c'est possible. Bien sûr. Et uh, puisque je suis censé ici donner un point de vue français, et je donnerai aussi le point de vue d'une française très européenne, uh, avant que Zaki uh, s'exprime sur pour l'Europe, uh, puisque uh, je suis ici avec un point de vue uh, français d'abord, je veux d'abord rappeler, avant toute chose, 
que la France est restée et restera un allié fidèle au sein de l'Alliance Atlantique, même si la relation transatlantique n'est plus ce qu'elle était. Euh, et qu'il va falloir effectivement essayer d'envisager toutes les conséquences de AUKUS et du retrait euh, d'Afghanistan. Alors, un bref rappel historique aussi, comme Jean-Claude euh, vient de le faire. Euh, D'abord, euh, il y a eu une continuité remarquable dans la politique française vis-à-vis -vis des États-Unis et de l'Alliance atlantique. Euh, de, depuis, euh, c'est vrai, euh, depuis la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, et même auparavant, euh, alors que, euh, le, naturellement, la France est très reconnaissante euh, de l'appui la, la, décisif dans la victoire, et évidemment très consciente et très reconnaissante du sacrifice de tant de jeunes Américains, mais il n'y a jamais eu un alignement euh, total de la politique française sur la politique des États-Unis. Et ça, vous, on remarque ça du général de Gaulle, jusque euh, à Emmanuel Macron, en passant par euh, François Mitterrand et par Nicolas Sarkozy et François Hollande. C'est-à-dire que allié oui, aligné non. La, la France et l'Europe, du point de vue de la France, ont, ont des intérêts qui peuvent converger, qui sont globalement convergents avec ceux des États-Unis, si on regarde les valeurs, naturellement, euh, la volonté de maintenir un système euh, multilatéral qui fonctionne, mais euh, la France et l'Europe ont des intérêts propres à faire valoir qui, quelquefois, ne coïncident pas toujours avec ceux des États-Unis euh, d'Amérique. Et donc, si je veux résumer le, le point de vue français, je dirais aussi que la France, est, me semble-t-il, plaide pour qu'il y ait un partage des rôles, pour que sur ces ententes fondamentales qui fondent l'Alliance Atlantique, nous puissions euh, travailler ensemble plutôt et travailler dans un bon esprit de respect mutuel, et non pas, comme ça vient de se produire avec AUKUS, n'est-ce pas, euh, avec des attitudes euh, qui, au moins dans la forme, signons sur le fond, il y a peut-être dans le contrat, mais on voit bien que la dénonciation de ce contrat a moins de conséquences sur le plan industriel qu'il n'en a sur le plan géostratégique. Et c'est ça, me semble-t-il, qui est important. Or, ce que je constate, personnellement avec regret, mais je ne suis pas la seule, c'est que depuis le début des années 2000, on assiste à un découplage, qui n'est pas un divorce, mais enfin un éloignement euh, euh, de, 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 de la France, de l'Europe et des États-Unis. Et que euh, ça ne remet pas en cause euh, l'essentiel, heureusement, mais ça renforce le non-alignement, justement, euh, sur les États-Unis d'Amérique, malgré les pressions euh, plus fortes euh, de ces derniers. Alors, il y a trois dates, là, qui sont essentielles. 2003, la guerre d'Irak, qui a provoqué, dont on sait qu'elle a été fondée sur un mensonge, mais ça s'est su après, qui a provoqué une division entre Européens et un, un éloignement vis-à-vis euh, -vis, euh, des États-Unis, avec des répercussions sur le Royaume-Uni. Moi, je pense que c'est le premier acte du Brexit, il est là. La guerre d'Irak et la division. Le deux, la deuxième date, c'est août 2013, quand euh, les bombardements chimiques euh, de, euh, sur, de Bachar el-Assad sur son propre peuple hein, euh, constituaient une ligne rouge pour Barack Obama. Tout était prêt pour une intervention, un bombardement des installations chimiques en Syrie. À la dernière minute, hein, Obama euh, décide de ne pas, euh, de, de ne pas intervenir. Donc après le discours sur le pivot asiatique, évidemment, ça a été ressenti comme euh, un lâchage euh, par, euh, par les États-Unis. Et donc, on a euh, cette, euh, cette, euh, cette différence qui s'est exprimée euh, fréquemment dans l'attitude vis-à-vis de la Russie, parce que la France a toujours prôné la continuité du dialogue, même si c'est difficile, et d'ailleurs de plus en plus difficile, surtout depuis l'invasion, euh, l'annexion de, de l'Ukraine, mais euh, qui a fait aussi euh, c est, c est, c est, c est, cette attitude euh, des États-Unis a eu des conséquences euh, considérables. Euh, la Russie a aidé Bachar al-Assad à gagner la guerre, mais pas la paix. 
euh, a étendu son influence dans tout le Proche et Moyen-Orient. Euh, L'Iran s'est trouvé beaucoup plus libre de faire euh, ce qu'il voulait, et la Turquie également. Alors, après AUKUS, là où nous en sommes, certains disent, oh, mais une fois que la France aura exprimé euh, son, euh, sa colère, sa colère, c'était une vraie colère, <rire> euh, it will be business as usual. It will not be business as usual. Parce que, euh, d'abord, mon sentiment, c'est que même si euh, AUKUS peut avoir un intérêt tactique et a un réel intérêt tactique, pour le Royaume-Uni, c'est le premier accord global pour Global, global Britain depuis le Brexit. Mais ce n'est pas l'Australie qui va aider euh, le Royaume-Uni à résoudre ces problèmes quotidiens qui font... Euh, pour euh, euh, les États-Unis, bien sûr, c'est important de renforcer sa présence stratégique dans cet espace euh, indo-pacifique. Mais quid des Européens qui ont une présence, qui ont une stratégie J'imagine que Zaki va, euh, va en reparler. Et puis, de toute façon, nous avons euh, besoin d'être ensemble européens et américains, pour faire face à ces enjeux globaux. Et nous avons besoin là aussi, et heureusement, euh, je rejoins Jean-Claude, j'espère qu'il n'y aura pas de nouvelle guerre froide, parce que je ne vois pas comment on peut résoudre la question du climat en étant dans une guerre froide avec la Chine, hein, qui est le premier émetteur de CO2 au monde. Voilà. Alors, tout ça plaide pour le dialogue, la poursuite du dialogue, et avec la Russie et avec la Chine, ça plaide aussi pour que les Européens se recentrent sur les défis prioritaires pour eux, qui sont naturellement euh, la sécurité à l'Est. Hein. Je suis heureuse de retrouver Bogdan, avec lequel nous avons un dialogue poursuivi là-dessus. La sécurité à l'Est, l'Allemagne joue un rôle fondamental, mais elle est ambiguë vis-à-vis -vis de la Russie, hein, avec le, le Nord Stream, mais la sécurité à l'Est, à rechercher avec euh, Poutine, même si c'est très difficile, et puis l'Afrique. Il n'y a pas d'enjeu stratégique plus important pour l'Europe que l'Afrique. Et c'est très important pour les États-Unis, parce que la Chine ne cesse, la Chine et la Russie et la Turquie, ne cessent de renforcer hein, leur présence euh, dans, sur ce continent, qui, à mes yeux, est un continent d'avenir. Et en tout cas, si l'Europe et les États-Unis ont intérêt à... Euh, euh, ce que euh, les, euh, le, 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 le sous-emploi des jeunes en Afrique, le, la sécurité dans le Sahel, la question du climat puisse être, euh, avoir des solutions, je pense que euh, les États-Unis ont tout à fait intérêt à ce que l'Europe euh, soit euh, beaucoup plus forte, se recentre, et à ce qu'on recherche une complémentarité plutôt qu'une compétition entre l'Europe et les États-Unis. Alors, je suis moi très heureuse que la naïveté vis-à-vis -vis, euh, de la politique chinoise qui a prévalu un certain temps, chaque, les Européens se battant entre eux pour être les meilleurs amis de la Chine, ait pris fin. Je pense que maintenant, on examine avec lucidité ce qui se passe, mais euh, en même temps, c'est aussi avec la Chine qu'il faudra trouver des solutions sur le climat. Merci beaucoup. I'd like to perhaps later on in the discussion come back to that question. How you reconcile what you said on the one hand the decoupling between the US and Europe and on the other hand the necessity of maintaining a relationship. But perhaps some of the other speakers can address that question and I turn to Bogdan Klitsch who is former defense minister of Poland and of course who is particularly involved in the question of organizing the security relationship between Europe and the US. Bogdan. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Carl. I will not concentrate on the history, even the recent history between our meeting in, uh, uh, in Rabat and, uh, and here, although so much happened that it would be necessary to mention that. I will concentrate on the current uh, uh, threats and challenges per perception uh, not going too far, not going beyond the traditional uh, uh, Euro-Atlantic area. So, some words about uh, Russia, 
NATO and the response of the European Union. Russia, uh, without doubt, remains an aggressive and disruptive uh, power that challenged the international order in Ukraine. We we're talking about that uh, two years and three years ago. Uh, showing uh, to be ready to use the force overseas, uh, then in Syria, now in Libya, and also in the Sahel. Let's remember about the presence of Wagner units in, uh, in Sahel. Russia tries to reintegrate as big as part of the post-Soviet space as possible. Uh, we are witnesses of the soft annexation of, uh, of Belarus that didn't begin uh, recently, that began uh, before the, uh, uh, the revolution of uh, freedom in that country, in Belarus, but accelerated uh, according to those processes uh, recently. Without doubt, Rus Russia will interfere with uh, political processes of the West, mainly with elections, as it did uh, in 2016 in the US and 2015 in my country, trying to deepen in divisions in the West, both within NATO and within the European community. Uh, I, have, I am convinced that uh, Russia will try to establish a dominant military position in the Arctic. Let's take it seriously into consideration. Although this uh, rivalry between powers and uh, various actors uh, is not so clear right now. And we'll continue to set up new rel relationships uh, uh, in Africa, playing here in the Middle East uh, an important and influential role. On the other hand, uh, one should be aware of Russian disadvantages. I mean, especially small economy that creates around 2% of uh, a global GDP and uh, dependence on uh, energy prices. Uh, uh, but taking, let's take into account also its advantages. That's important. Uh, large conventional forces, modernized weapons of uh, mass destruction, energy resources and aggressive foreign policy that uh, <coughs> we can observe especially during last uh, last uh, decade so when china from the from the european point of view is a big challenge for europe <coughs> russia creates a threat for europe especially for central europe what about nato in such uh, circumstances we wait of course for a new strategic uh, concept the former, the current one is outdated. Uh, I took part in shaping this uh, Lisbon uh, uh, strategic concept in 2010. So uh, uh, let's remember that uh, among its uh, three essential goals, es essential tasks, uh, the second, uh, I mean, the crisis management uh, uh, was put aside and will not be introduced uh, in uh, years or decades and uh, quick withdrawal from both uh, the ISAF mission before and recently the, uh, uh, the, the, the resolute support uh, mission shows that there is a, a crisis management fatigue and uh, uh, the alliance will not return easily to this, uh, to this task. And the third uh, essential goal, I mean, uh, uh, the international cooperative security model doesn't exist anymore. Doesn't exist anymore because uh, it was based on the assumption that dialogue is uh, much better than confrontation, that cooperation is better than uh, uh, that uh, confrontation. And frankly speaking, it was uh, blown up by the invasion of Russian troops uh, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, both uh, uh, in the Crimea and in, uh, in Donbass. And it was not uh, replaced by any other concept of, uh, of security. So we have from this existing uh, current strategic concept only the first essential goal, and this is a deterrence and, uh, and defense. Uh, 
the next strategic concept has to be uh, has to be uh, extended and has to uh, incorporate the current challenges and current uh, tasks uh, stemming uh, not only from Russian but also from Chinese uh, uh, foreign and security uh, policy and should respond to current uh, main uh, threats uh, like for example energy or cyber threats. The report NATO 2030 is a kind of indicator what could be and what should be according to my understanding introduced into this, uh, this concept and into the practice of the alliance. First of all, a real political unity of, uh, of NATO. We witnessed during the President uh, Trump's area uh, a good military cooperation, absolutely a good uh, military cooperation, but with a bad political dialogue within uh, NATO. So such a political unity, such an uh, improvement of the political transatlantic link should be the main task for, uh, of, for, for all the allies. Secondly, what is important, it is the return to values, to those values that are important for both, I mean, for NATO and for the EU, that were described in 1949 in the preamble of the Washington Treaty, democracy, the rule of law, uh, 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 human rights, uh, public liberties, etc., etc., uh, that should create uh, the real basis for cooperation between nations. I don't exclude, of course, uh, national interests, and they will be the driving force of, uh, of the alliance, but this uh, ethical basis should be, uh, should be reinforced. And thirdly, what was important part of, uh, of the report, this is the cooperation with the European Union. Not only the political, but institutional cooperation with the European Union I will try to continue this in the discussion because uh, uh, within the EU right now we are after the after the end after the recovery from the uh, crisis of political will as for uh, the uh, uh, development of the common security and defense policy with creation of uh, European defense fund with in the activation of pesco with uh, a card mechanism and with implementation of the global strategy of the EU, but we are facing another crisis connected with financial challenges that we face right now because of the coronavirus consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Bogdan. This question of reconciling Atlantic and European approaches to deal with security, we should really come back to that in the discussion because it's absolutely central in the wake of the present crisis between the US and Europe on the issues that uh, were mentioned before. Uh, I'll turn to Jim Bitterman, who... Jim is not here. Oh, he's not here. I'm sorry. He's not uh, here, Heidi. I'm very sorry. Um, um, Zaki? No, no, it's yourself. It's done. No, no. And, um, Yes, of course. Are you talking to me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Since you didn't mention the, the name of the speaker, I was wondering if you were mentioning my name or the name of my neighbor. It's myself. Sorry. Are you talking to me? Yes. I'm, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, well, the, I, I, I will try to answer the question you addressed. Uh, and the question is, how do you understand power relations in the world today, right? So, in my view, there are two main uh, trends in the international system. One is the rise of the Sino-American competition in the world, which is certainly going to be the dominant feature of the international system in this century, and there's no doubt about this. And in comparison to the Cold War, I mean, there is a difference. And the difference is that the competition between the United States and China 
is much more, is wider than the Cold War because it includes an economic and technological component which didn't exist during the Cold War. So in a sense, the, the challenges of the Sino-American rivalry or competition are much wider. Now, uh, it is not going to be like the Cold War, why? Because at the same time, in the international system, you have a second dynamic which is taking place. And the second dynamic is created by the rise of a multipolar world. In other words, what characterizes the international system today, make it quite complex and unstable, is the articulation between this bipolar structure and a multipolar structure, okay? So we have a combination of both in the international system. So when we start thinking about the international system, we have to keep in mind both dynamics. And the, 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 the important question is to understand how international actors are reacting to those main dynamics. And in my view, this new organization of the international system is creating three kinds of actors. The first are what I call the followers. The second are what I call the bystanders. And the third uh, are what I call the hedgers. And let me develop, if you allow me to do so, the, those three main uh, cat, uh, actors. The followers are those who decided on purpose, for national reasons, to take side in the Sino-American competition. So they think that they will increase the national leverage in being part of that competition. And what we saw with Australia is a perfect illustration of this, in a sense that three years ago, the, the, uh, the, the, first, the, the Prime Minister of Australia said that Australia is not going to take side between the United States and China, and now they decided to align on the United States, which is a perfectly respectable choice made by the Australian, so, I mean, my point here is not to say if it's good or bad, I'm just trying to analyze the international system and it works. But the decision taken by the Australians has another implication. It means that China's influence is resented in the world negatively by an increasing number of countries, and not only in the West, that's what our Chinese friends think. But in, in many other parts of the world, the Chinese influence is resented. And I think that it's a mixed message which is sent by AUKUS. And in my view, the Chinese should take this into account. But obviously, there is a source of polarization around this, uh, uh, this conflict. So, that, and on the other side, on the Chinese side, you can, for example, argue that Pakistan has decided to side uh, with uh, uh, China, which, and the Pakistanis used to say that China is an all-weather ally, okay? So you have countries who are going to take sides, very clearly. You have a second category of uh, countries who are bystanders. They are waiting, they are seeing, in many cases, they don't feel for the moment concerned by the competition between the United States and China. And many countries in Africa, even in the Middle East or in Latin America, I mean, are seeing the rise of this competition, but I mean, don't feel necessary concern. But so they are they're bystanding. They are not taking side. They have good relation with both sides, and they think that they can increase their leverage and defend their national interests without taking sides. And for the moment, 
it's the majority of the countries. You have a third category, which is, in my view, extremely important, which is what I call the hedgers. So the hedgers, uh, coming from the, the verb to, her, to hedge, uh, concerns large countries, significant countries, who want to increase their leverage in the international system, who understood that this competition is going to be crucial, and want to uh, play on this competition to increase their leverage. And you have, I'll give you three examples who are totally different. You have the case of Russia, you have the case of Turkey, and you have the case of India. If you take the case of Russia, Russia obviously, obviously understood that it's not going to become once again, the big power, but they want to increase considerably their leverage in the international system against the West, against Europe, against the United States, and in building an informal alliance with the Chinese, not a formal alliance, it's an informal alliance to increase their leverage. So they think that this competition between the United States and China is going to benefit Russia uh, in a way or another, and there are plenty of examples uh, uh, in this uh, regard. The Indians, and particularly after what happened in uh, Afghanistan, uh, are of course keen to increase their independence, and they are not going to become the followers of the United States, that's not in the uh, Indian parameters, but, but, uh, they are certainly going within the Quad, for example, increase the strategic cooperation with the United States, of course, to uh, balance uh, China, which is their uh, main rival in the international uh, system. And the third case, which is also very different from the two others, in the case of Turkey. Of course, Turkey is not concerned by the Sino-American rift uh, in as such, but Turkey understood that there is a slightly weakening of the position of the United States in the world, and they want to take advantage of this uh, to increase their leverage vis-a-vis -vis the United States in, for example, having a purely, uh, let's say, um, I mean, interested relationship with, uh, with, uh, with Russia, and Russia, of course, understood that they can or they have to accept many things from the Turks if they want to have the Turks more independent from the United States. Now, in all this, where Europe stands? Europe has two liabilities in this. First, because Europe is not a state. It's not a state. And second, Europe was not historically constructed to deal with power politics. So we have structurally to face those two main constraints. Not being a state, so we have to define common interests. And second, I mean, the driving force behind the European Union was not power politics. I mean, I used to say that Europe was historically built against power politics. So it's a sea change, but we cannot afford uh, staying uh, like a soft power because all instruments of soft power are becoming now instrument of hard powers. So if we, and I will uh, finish with this, we have those three main actors, the United States, Russia, and China, among others, of course. Vis-a-vis -vis the United States, I mean, nobody seriously in Europe discuss the fact that NATO is the backbone of our security. So there's no serious debate about this. The debate is whether NATO is the exclusive instrument uh, for our security. That's the first question. And there is an additional question concerning the nature of the relationship within NATO. 
And obviously, on those two questions, there are debates. But I think that there is an insatisfaction on both, uh, on those two points. Uh, there are areas in which, obviously, Europeans have an interest, but within which NATO is not going to be involved. And you mentioned Sahel. It's a good illustration of this. So uh, we need to have a common position. We need to have a common European involvement in this part of the world because NATO is not going to be the answer to all our security problems. And I think that the Americans uh, are understanding this quite uh, seriously. And that was mentioned in the communique between uh, uh, Biden and, uh, and, and Macron. And second, there is a kind of insatisfaction on the nature of the dialogue between the United States and Europe within NATO. Uh, so obviously this view is uh, not shared by all member states in Europe. But uh, the point, and I think that the HRVP will develop it uh, later on in his dialogue with uh, Thierry. The point is uh, that first of all, you have NATO members who are not part of the European Union. And this is a problem. And this is a problem. Because when we talk about constructing a European pillar in Europe, I mean, within NATO, I mean, we have non-EU countries uh, who are uh, part of the debate in NATO. So by construction, NATO cannot be the exclusive place where our strategic dialogue with the United States should take place. And actually, the United States have accepted that since they, in the recent I mean, following the visit of President Biden in Brussels, they, the United States have accepted the idea of a, dial, a strategic dialogue between the EU and the United States. But it's not in opposition to NATO. It's just if we want to have a European pillar within NATO, we need to construct this European pillar. And in order to construct this European pillar, we need to have a, a concentration, a dialogue among Europeans. So there is no contradiction accepted if we consider that the status quo is quite perfect. Thank now, uh, two words uh, on... Thank you very much. I think <laughs> okay, I will stop up. here. Right, thank, <laughs> you. thank you. This still raises the question whether with regard to the Indo-Pacific, Europe to use your express will be a hedging or a following partner. And we turn now to Ana Palacio, okay. former minister, foreign minister of Spain, who will help us to define Merci Europe's Carl. position. Merci, Carl. Moi, j'aimerais que tu oublies mon nom et comme ça, tu serais plus flexible sur le temps. Mais enfin, maintenant, sérieusement, merci Thierry et merci à l'organisation pour cette rentrée qui a toujours marqué la rentrée de l'année scolaire, de l'année vraiment de la pensée intellectuelle. Mais maintenant, ça, rentre, ça marque une rentrée plus importante et qui est la rentrée post-Covid. Well, I will switch into English now. I will elaborate on, on what, uh, what Mr. Leike has said. Uh, and I would say that speaking late, it's just like, uh, it's difficult because you would like to respond or to back certain, many of what has been said. So I will try to take another position. Uh, we always face these two poles, power and rules. And we have heard this morning several times that what is at stake is a rules-based order, the, this liberal international order. And it is, and uh, it has been mentioned by different speakers, um, I mean, it's not adapted to the, this reality. This post-World War II order is not adapted to the new reality of sh shifts in powers of uh, just private actors, or a plethora of actors, and, uh, and this change in instruments. Law is not what it used to be, it's not just treaties, but it's not law. But what is today very striking is how it is contested. And I will just mention the UNGA, the 76th meeting of the United Nations General Assembly. It came from different geographies with different voices. So I will elaborate on this, and I will take, a, again, a kind of taxonomy. In the end, I'm French by culture, so I would, not in three, but in five. We have here the actors, and this is just the complementarity with your actors. 
vis-a-vis -vis the rules-based order, we have the Europeans. The Europeans are no, no doubt the standard bearers, the standard bearers of the, of the rules-based order with internal problems. Uh, I, I mean, it has, been, it has been mentioned by Bogdan externally, but also internally. We have to agree on what is the interpretation of Article 2, or to agree that the interpretation of Article 2 of our treaty is for, for the, the court. And uh, we could go there, I leave it. We have the ambivalent, which is the United States. Ambivalent historically, uh, the United States created this order, but has always been ambivalent about participating. Uh, the United States just signs, but not ratifies, and we have seen this from the inception of the of the of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the of the twenties, in the uh, before even the the. Uh, uh, let me, I, in the, in the, before the San Francisco Charter and even then. We have then um, the smooth operator, and this is China. And if I, I would mention this, it was very clear, and this gives you an answer to this issue of Cold War. For me, the most expected uh, intervention, which was the intervention of, of uh, President uh, Biden, was loaded by the insecurity of this nation that is broken, of this country that needs healing, of this society that is polarized. In 89, they asked us Europeans to be whole and free. We asked them to be healed, because unless we have that, it will be extremely, extremely difficult. But uh, the President Biden said, I mean, we don't want a Cold War, nor, and he insisted on that. I don't, I cannot just quote, but I'm paraphrasing. Why this excuse? We don't want, we are not pursuing a Cold War. Why this excuse? Xi Jinping took it. And China is the smooth operator of this rules-based order. The smooth operator in bringing certain concepts that are completely alien, like the harmony concept, and taking advantage of this weakness of the United States. And then I would say that there is the world. And again in UNGA, in, this, uh, in the, the General Assembly, it was extremely I interesting to listen to other actors. I will mention uh, Iran. Iran opened with an aggressiveness. You have mentioned about this aggressiveness uh, uh, about China. Iran was brutal. Starting, there are two events that have marked this year. The, the attack by the people against the, the Congress in the United States and then people dropping from planes in Afghanistan. Uh, Afghan people dropping from planes in Afghanistan was brutal. But for me, the most, the most salient in this, uh, in the, in this complex uh, just issue was, I mean, this complex was Lavrov. Lavrov made in cause general, a general indictment against the rules-based order. It's a speech that is worth reading from first to last word because it's extremely well done. And as I say, it takes this, this position that makes uh, Russia, yeah, a disruptive, but a disruptive strategies. So we, we have the standard bearer, we have the ambivalent, we have the smooth operator, and Russia, I th Russia has a clear strategy. And it is a disruptive strategy, but a strategy nevertheless. I, I mean, the quotes, we should quote all this, all this speech with references to Crimea, with reference to the United Nations. Last but not least, and this is hope. It's the intervention by India. I could mention other interventions by Africans that were extremely interesting, but as I don't have time, India. India, uh, Prime Minister Modi does something which is extremely interesting. He dissociates democracy from the heritage of colonialism. He said at the, at the beginning of the speech, I'm speaking on behalf of the mother of democracies, because democracy is a tradition in India 
uh, for 2,000 years. And then he says, it's our 70th, we just celebrated our 70th anniversary of independence. So with all that, what do I mean? And I conclude here. We Europeans, we have a role to play. To play by convincing the United States that it is in their interest to update, to keep what is important. And there are many important things about the, the international rules-based order, but to adapt it. And in this adaptation, we have to give voice to other visions of what democracy means. When you listen to Prime Minister Modi, you say, but what democracy is he speaking about? Well, he explains it. We need to be open to other cultures, to other, uh, other formulations that do not weaken the basic pillars, but adapt this rules-based order to the world of today. Thank you, Anna. Uh, finally, um, we turn to Igor Jürgens. Oh, I see we have uh, uh, Wang Yizi on, yeah. on Zoom. That's wonderful. So uh, before we turn to Igor, I think I would like to turn to Wang Yizi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Wonderful, wonderful. That uh, who, who joins us now from Beijing. Uh, he heads the Institute uh, of International Strategic Studies. Uh, I trust you have listened to us to our debate so far, uh, and uh, you may want to, to comment on some of the points that were made with regards to the conflict between China and the United States and its allies. So the floor is yours. I'm honored to make a presentation to WPC. Today, October 1st, is the National Day of the People's Republic of China. Everybody is on holiday today, and I so uh, I am speaking from my humble house. Prior to this date, three international events have boosted China's national pride and stimulated Chinese nationalistic feelings. The first event was the withdrawal of US troops from Afghanistan in August. The second was the quarrel between the US, Australia and the UK on one side and France and the EU on the other side. Over AUKUS, a trilateral three, uh, security pact between Australia and the United Kingdom and the, the US, announced on September 15th for the Indo-Pacific region. Under the pact, the US and the UK will help Australia to acquire nuclear-powered submarines. The pact is largely seen as directed at China. The Morrison government of Australia announced it was cancelling its 90 billion US dollars submarine contract with the French. On September 17th, France recalled its ambassadors from Australia and the US. Four days later, EU officials were demanding answers and an apology from Australia. The Chinese, of course, take pressure, pleasure from <clears throat> these tensions among Westerners, although China would not gain anything substantive from their discord. The third event was the release of Ms. Meng Wanzhou, the CEO of Huawei, who had been detained in Canada for three years on criminal charges related to secret deals with Iran. Chinese officials and citizens alike celebrated Meng's return home as a significant uh, victory and a sign of China's political power and diplomatic clout, without mentioning and ever knowing uh, any compromise on the Chinese side. I will make a few comments only on China's reaction to the, the changes in Afghanistan. For good reason, Beijing has gloated over U.S. pullout from Afghanistan after a costly 20-year intervention in this country. China's diplomats remarked that America's myth is down, and more and more people are awakening when it is seen as a failure of Western-type 
democracy in the whole country. In the Chinese eyes, the loss of U.S. influences in Afghanistan is a reflection of what China calls the East rising, West declining tide in global politics in general and the waning of U.S. power in the greater Middle East in particular. China's comparative advantage in Pakistan and the Middle East uh, are twofold. First is economic and technological capacities. China borders Afghanistan and is seeking ways to encourage, to engage with the Taliban regime when the West is reluctant to do so. China will provide food, winter weather supplies, uh, vaccines, and medicine to Taliban-controlled Afghanistan worth almost 31 million US dollars. China will also be capable of improving Afghan's uh, telecommunication networks in the Taliban-controlled area if needed, as it has done in the Gulf region. Such actions could strengthen China's hand at the expense of U.S. influences. Now that China's U.S. strategic competition intensifies, it is increasingly observed that China's gain is the West's loss. Another Chinese advantage is its diplomatic standing that does not offend any governments and groups in the Middle East and Central Asia. But India seems to be a loser after the Taliban's occupation of the country, backed by Pakistan. As a strong informal ally of Pakistan, China could use its leverage to gain better connections with the Taliban. China has already coordinated diplomatic activities with Russia, Central Asian states, Pakistan, Qatar, Turkey, and Iran on uh, Afghan affairs. At the same time, China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi also talked to U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken and NATO's chief concerning the Afghan situation. China urged an end to sanctions on Afghanistan and said Taliban should be given access to foreign reserves to ease financial crisis, underscoring its policy differences with the West. In return, the Taliban called China a good friend and pledged to never allow any forces to use the, the Afghan territory to engage in acts detrimental to China. However, China also has its weaknesses in the region. For one thing, apart from Pakistan, China has few allies and its social and humanitarian connections with regional states are limited. Its connections are basically with government officials. Compared to Western players, China is a latecomer in talking to local interlocutors. China also lacks forceful means to take actions to protect its enterprises, businesses, and citizens when they are at stake. There were increased incidents in the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC, that threatened Chinese workers. Even if the Afghan Taliban could be a bit more friendly to China, the Chinese should be concerned about other radical treat, uh, groups such as ISK and Al-Qaeda. In Earth, an uncertain number of Xinjiang Uyghur insurgents or refugees have fled to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and some other Islamic countries. China has asked for their return, but so far has had only limited success. This sense of insecurity and uncertainty explains why China is showing caution in moving into Afghanistan for economic benefits. China does not seem to be ready for granting the Taliban government diplomatic recognition given international pressures and the lack of transparency and inclusiveness of the new Kabul government. In this sense, China is faced with 
opportunities and challenges alike. What is more, less U.S. presence in the Middle East may mean more U.S. presence in the Asia-Pacific region that China does not want to see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yisi, for your remarks. We'll come back to them in our discussion. And finally, I want to turn to, to Igor Jurgens, who uh, is the president of the Russian Union of Industrialists and, and Entrepreneurs. We've talked a lot about Russia. Igor, you may want to comment uh, how you see the long-term future uh, of Russia's relations, with, uh, particularly with the West, which at the moment uh, are politically very bad, although, interestingly, trade is going up. All right, Igor. Thank you very much, Carl, and special thanks to Thierry de Montbrial, of course, for this fantastic opportunity to talk offline. Uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't get all of the speech of, of our uh, Chinese colleague, because I will start with the, your idea of followers and hedgers. We are at the same time followers and hedgers, and believe me, inside the Russia, there are followers who would definitely would like to go along the centrally planning, economic and politically robust anti-Western policies. And there are hedgers who want to use this to restore the relationship with, uh, with the West. Uh, in 2003, Mr. Putin signed strategic partnership and cooperation agreement with the European Union. We started building common economic space, common security space, common everything. Okay, so now we arrive to the situation of strategic confrontation and vice versa with the Chinese People Republic. We were at war on the Mansky Island uh, 50 years ago and now we're in strategic partnership embracing each other. This partnership is not harmonious. Many in Russia think that economic cooperation is lopsided, one-sided uh, and uh, investment is not coming. But militarily and politically at this, at this particular period, we don't have any other place to go. And this is a, a marriage of convenience, which, uh, which will go on for some time, no question about that. But the coupling of the United States and China, which is taking place now, is very hard uh, test for us too. It will bring uh, more volatility on the financial markets, on economic markets, on the uh, supply chain, uh, it will bring more uh, tension to the international system and to Russia also. And uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, making an estimate whether it's a Cold War or not yet a Cold War, but something else, I would say it's very close to the Cold War with uh, this uh, broadening of extent of the Cold War, uh, because it. Be, you know, only two years ago, uh, from from the same uh, rostrums uh, uh, and the same same panels uh, as today, I was hearing that th there is no ideological component of the Cold War now because we are all in the free markets and everything else. Judging by the statements fr uh, from the President Xi Jinping and what is being in the make for the uh, 20th Congress of the Communist Party of China for the next year. Uh, it is now ideological too, the same way it was between the Soviet Union and the United States. So from this point of view, I would say that uh, uh, hedgers in Russia uh, would be very cautious in taking sides if the coupling takes a, a, a resolute, uh, a resolute uh, a final uh, countdown because uh, we, I cannot imagine what will happen on the Russian stock exchange if, for example, tomorrow there is a conflict around Taiwan. And this conflict is in the making. If I, if I hear uh, uh, all right, then uh, the, the, the example of Hong Kong can show what might happen in the Chinese world, including Taiwan, if, if this decoupling goes all the way down. And which brings me to AUKUS. Uh, AUKUS is the creation of the new bloc. Uh, for Russia, it's very dangerous because NATO is, uh, is, uh, uh, is an opponent and uh, bordering on being an enemy, but it's an understandable enemy 
It's an enemy with whom we have relations for uh, all those 50 years. It's an enemy or <laughs> opponent uh, with whom we have uh, uh, diplomatic relations. We have the Russian NATO Council. Uh, it's idle at the moment, but we have this instrument. What will happen with AUKUS or something else which would be created instead of uh, unified NATO is, is a big question mark. If tomorrow, for example, our Polish friends and, and Baltic states would uh, decide to create the same kind of a caucus uh, uh, on the borders of Russia because of the Ukrainian situation or, or something else, then, then it, it's, a, it's a real danger. So this is the second danger. Uh, China, Russia, uh, China, United States decoupling, AUKUS, then comes Afghanistan, which was mentioned here too. Uh, Afghanistan, uh, uh, I'm not talking and not commenting on how Biden decided to, to, to ex execute logistically the, the, this thing. But uh, it's a smart move if you talk about Russian-American confrontation because you give all these Islamic problems to, to, to Russian border. <laughs> smart move. Right. And you, you give it partly, of course, to China and Pakistan, but uh, that's beside the point. Uh, the most uh, serious thing is happening on the Tajik, Uzbek, uh, Turkmenian border, where we have uh, our troops and our military installations. So from this point of view, I think that we are heading into a very serious confrontation before the things will get better. Because uh, when the United States declared that uh, uh, semiconductors will not be given to China at all, Finished. We are, we are building that in Wyoming and other states. When the United States said that we are blacklisting Chinese PLCs, publicly owned companies, blacklisting them uh, on the one hand, and then Chinese replied that uh, no more information will be transferred from China to abroad without our full control, uh, which is the blockade, or informational blockade and everything else. So. It's a beginning of something which we don't know the end of. And Taiwan would be probably one of the testing grounds, but, but it's a very serious showdown. At the moment, Russia will be with China, at least verbally, but will be hedging its risk, no question about that. So uh, just to end on the, on the bright note, I would say yes, sustainable development concept. If they take it seriously in Glasgow next month, and if we really have an architecture for this sustainable development, decarbonization, green economy and all of that stuff, that gives us uh, the, the platform for the green diplomacy. No question about that. But before we get that, uh, here I, I'm, I'm with Greta Thunberg. It's 30 years lifespan. Uh, all of the tycoons in oil and gas say, OK, OK, 2050, but we will do our profit at the moment. And before we agree on all those transitory taxation of carbon and everything else, we'll, we'll blackmail Europe uh, by, 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 car, by coal, by gas, by oil, because you need that. You, you, you see what's happening with the gas price in Europe. So this is, uh, before we get better, we will get worse. And uh, unfortunately, the blame should be put on both sides. And I would then die by saying that uh, my colleague on the right remembers perfectly well when in Brussels we signed cooperation partnership and we thought that we are in the same family. And where we are now, we see. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Igor. We have about a quarter of an hour for the debate, so we have time for some, please, short questions from the audience and short answers. So let's start. And I don't see who would like to start from the audience. My name is Ibtisam al Kitbi. I am the head of Emirates Policy Center in Abu Dhabi. Uh, this competition between China and the uh, United States has been discussed in um, Bratislava, Global SIG, uh, Security Conference. And there were two Europeans the Eastern European and the Western European. The debate was that, well, uh, when it comes to money, United States does not give money, does, does not give any importance for Eastern Europe 
And they, if they ask to see the president, they've never been uh, give the chance. While China comes with the money and whatever they will ask, they will uh, be given. Same in the Gulf. Now, we have the same dilemma. United States wants also uh, nowadays, of course, with the new alignment, that uh, we give everything, but United States are not giving, are not going to give anything, and they are asking us to uh, leave China. Now, this is the dilemma. While you have your economy, the Chinese are able to help, but the Americans are not willing to help in terms of economy, even with the protection militarily protection, the Americans are moving away from the region. So the question now, if we are, the Western European, the Gulf is, to choose between these two, this is also the question to be debated. Thank you. Uh, Eastern Europe was addressed, so Bogdan and America was addressed <laughs> for you. Okay, Bogdan, you start. And With let's pleasure. Thank you very much for this question because it is... Uh, important to underline this uh, difference between the approach of the United States and the European Union towards <coughs> China. We say in Europe uh, that uh, China is a challenge when uh, Russia is a threat. And uh, uh, there is a difference with, for example, this opinion that was introduced into the national security strategy of the United States from 2018. And the specific, uh, uh, the specific challenge for the countries of Central Europe, <coughs> this is the format 16 plus 1, now 15 plus 1, after the decision of Lithuanian government to withdraw from this format 16 plus 1, that country, and after, you know, the confrontation with China that was uh, against the involvement of, uh, uh, of Taiwan uh, in the relationship with uh, Lithuania. Majority of countries uh, uh, from Central Europe uh, decided to weaken, to weaken the relations with uh, China, not to go uh, uh, as far as President, uh, as Prime Minister Viktor Orban from Hungary did, uh, in involving its country and its economy in the full cooperation with China, with the presence of banks uh, and uh, Chinese capital, instead of. Uh, many other European uh, partners. So uh, within the European Union, we try to have the common uh, approach to China, although uh, I tried to describe, you know, you. those two, uh, let's say, uh, different positions, uh, one of Lithuania's government and the other of Hungarian's government as well. Okay, thank you. Jean-Claude. Uh, before being leading a think tank in Washington and participating another one. I was for many years, as some of you know, a banker and I worked for Citibank. And uh, between 2010 and 2014, I was based in New York and I was covering the emerging markets and talking to companies and seeing how we can help in providing banking services around the world. And I visited many countries like Pakistan, Algeria, Central America, and everywhere, surprisingly, surprisingly, Chinese construction companies were often the clients of Citibank. Where were they the clients of Citibank? For a very good reason. They didn't want to deal with the local banks, who often were not well organized, corrupted. They didn't want to work with the Europeans, often because they were representing the old colonial powers. And they were willing to work with us because we were the, the alternative. Not the alternative of choice, but the alternative of choice or non-choice of the other one. Having said that, I, I remember very well some conversation. And the conversation was as such. How's the business? And the people were saying, well, Chinese companies come. They are very aggressive on the commercial side. They offer us some very attractive terms. So we give them the contract. And then the problem starts. The problem is delays, the problem is cost overrun, and the problem is the fact that they don't create jobs because they bring their workers, and once the contract is over, they take back the workers. And at the end of the day, you end up in a situation where you didn't get what you wanted, you paid too much for it, 
you get into some debt. Look at what happened in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Malaysia, uh, it's a very good example. Malaysia was part of the bridge and road project for China, and ultimately they pulled back. Mm -hmm. And that happened with other countries. There's one Thank sentence. you. Uh, one sentence. Anna and then Saki. I think that we Europeans, and in this case, you from the Gulf, we cannot be so self-flagellating. Yes, it is true that uh, in, our, in our cooperation, there are strings attached. In our side, it's always <coughs> human rights and so on. But what, what we, we have to remind our partners in Africa, all over the world, is that China has strings attached, not just bringing, bringing workers, is that normally there is a barter exchange. I build this, this, I mean, this stadium, and you give me the, the product of this mine. And this is what is behind. We are seeing how in Ceylon, in Sri Lanka, and in other places, they have taken hold of just ports, big, big infrastructures in exchange for, uh, for loans or for money. So, again, we have a lot of issues, but with China, we have to be very clear cut as well that it's not just giving money, no strings attached. They don't give money, and there are strings that in the end are even, I mean, even more difficult to face than the ones that we from the start put on the table. Thank you, Thank you Anna. I may ask uh, Wang Yixi in a moment, but Saki, you have yeah, the next. Uh, from a European perspective, uh, the way we deal with China is, in my view, quite uh, smart in a sense that we have in our uh, strategy defined our position vis-a-vis -vis China as a partner, a competitor, and a strategic rival, okay? And uh, nobody mentioned the fact that the, that's exactly, at least officially, the position which had been adopted by the new ad American administration. It's exactly the same, same wording. I'm not saying that uh, the policy conducted is along those lines necessarily, but the way we, uh, we behave vis-a-vis -vis China is uh, hedging in a smart way. There are areas in which we have to cooperate with China. It's indispensable and very important for the international order. Uh, climate change is a very important issue. Uh, even uh, the GCPOA is an important issue, and the Chinese are playing a positive role in this, uh, in this area. Now, we have divergences, and from the discussion we had with the Chinese counterpart, uh, they said, yeah, we, we are, we are uh, partners, but we are not rivals. So please drop the idea of rivals. No, no, there is a rivalry with China because in terms of value, there are strong differences. And even in terms of interest, there are strong differences. And my personal view is concerning the 60 plus one. My, um, personally, I will prefer to have all members of the European Union yeah, being within the European Union when they talk to to China. There is no need to have a sub-specific uh, uh, sub-system of uh, relation between Europe and, uh, and, and, and China. Thank you very much. Uh, Yezi, would you like to comment on uh, China's policy vis-a-vis -vis the European Union and the US in this context? Uh, yes. Uh, I think the Chinese approach to Europe is different from its approach to the state. In Chinese eyes, it's, uh, the United States is a major problem, and Europe is a less, less of a problem. Uh, but they are, they are <laughs> going to beat each other in denouncing China's human rights uh, And some European powers even uh, joined the United States and was in uh, uh, doing some military acts in, in the South in, in South China Sea, and 
as we see it, uh, some European countries are closer to Taiwan than before. And these actions are alienated Europe from, from China. Uh, but I, my point is, China is not as angry uh, to Europeans as to, as to the Indian Americans. Uh, it, actually, the strategy to put it in place is to drive a wedge between the European Union and the United States. But whether they do so or not, I'm not too sure. Uh, on the one hand, China's actions are not so much assertive or aggressive. China's words, especially, is very much uh, assertive and aggressive. That, that those rhetoric's uh, are catering for China's domestic audiences, but difficult to distinguish uh, uh, between China's domestic uh, purposes and its uh, uh, international propaganda. So this is the problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Un unfortunately, time is up. And the chairman uh, reminds me that we should stick to the time because there are more events to follow. So first of all, I would like to thank the panel for their contributions. And I would like to conclude uh, with a word of caution on what we have said. Despite your relevant point that there's a great deal of continuity between the present administration and the previous one, and the point has been made very well indeed by, by Richard Haas in this, in this very readable piece. Yeah. However, however, the uncertainty of American domestic politics is a fact. Absolutely. And we do not know, we do not know what America will look like in 22 and in 24. And there may be a return of what we had before and what consequences that will have for the transatlantic relationship, for multilateralism, for relations with China, I'm sorry to say is at this point unpredictable. So uh, there is this uh, point, and it was made in an earlier, uh, uh, earlier discussion by Pierre Jacquet, there is always something unforeseen around in international politics, and it may happen again. But in any case, at this stage, I think uh, we can say that a new geopolitical structure is emerging. Uh, the Europeans are challenged to play a role in affecting this structure. Uh, and it poses enormous pressure on the Europeans themselves to get their house in order. And with that, I would like to thank the panel and close the session. Thank you very much.